Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Business Courier. The streetcar is still under construction, but one of its leading advocates says we can already do better. It's a hot market for OTR office space, and a local developer is preparing to deliver. And encouraging fun at work. It's a job requirement at Kings Island. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Good morning and welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Peg Rosconi. On the Business Courier front page centerpiece this week, a self-described civic entrepreneur, a fixture in the pro streetcar debate, is challenging the current plan. John Schneider says the project's route to Uptown needs a refresh, and that's just part of his next big idea. Schneider has been involved in all the major debates that have shaped downtown over the last 20 years, including the placement of Great American Ballpark. He wants the city to scrap the idea of running the streetcar to UC along Vine Street. In his vision, light rail would whisk residents from a wide variety of communities through tunnels in Mount Auburn to the streetcar line. More direct. They will be much faster. Uh, in one case especially, they, it has a better chance to promote economic development along the line, which is really the, the reason we're building the streetcars, for repopulating the city. Um, but, but also, uh, a lot of us want to see regional light rail. And we've built these tracks out here for light rail. Uh, when you have a light rail line that wants to go to Blue Ash or Springdale or something, a place like that, it needs to be very straight and direct. And, um, you know, so I would like to try to straighten out the, uh, the line north of downtown. Opponents say the streetcar is a wasteful project and the region won't embrace rail. But supporters like Schneider believe rail is essential to Cincinnati's economy for two reasons. It will quickly connect people to jobs and it will attract millennials and baby boomers who do not want car dependent lives. Schneider says he's trying to stretch people to think beyond. For more on his ideas, be sure to read Chris Wetterick's story in the print edition. Well, development around the streetcar line is continuing. Over the Rhine, real estate developer Urban Sites has purchased three OTR properties on Main Street for more than a million dollars with plans to turn the upper floors into office space. The buildings have three floors of vacant space above first floor bars, including Wellman's brand's Japs. Demand is high. So office space in Over the Rhine is at a premium, especially for creative agencies that want to be in a walkable urban environment. Um, it seems to be outstripping supply, so that's one of the reasons we acquired these properties. In the next couple months, urban sites will start interior demolition and structural work on the buildings. Maney said potential tenants have already expressed interest in the space. An OTR-based business accelerator that aims to help entrepreneurs in redevelopment neighborhoods advanced, or advanced rather, recently launched its second class. Mortar received more than 50 applications to compete for 18 spots. Co-founder Alan Wood said the selection process focuses on potential. We're an organization that's basically just designed to be a catalyst to help people get to where they want to go. Um, so we don't focus a lot on where they are right now or where they have been in the past. We focus on where they can go and what we see as the potential of actually reaching those goals. Wood said the new class is about 85% women, which is in line with national trends for women entrepreneurs. Ohio Governor John Kasich became the 16th major candidate to announce he's running for the 2016 Republican president no presidential nomination. Businesses concerned about the national debt may appreciate Kasich's work as House Budget Committee chairman in the 1990s, when Congress and President Bill Clinton reached an agreement that led to three years of budget surpluses instead of deficits. A local businesswoman from Union Township, Claremont County, spoke at the announcement. I'm not here as a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a political independent who votes my conscience. I'm here because my husband and I are among the many people across our state who have been able to push their dreams forward, not just because of our own hard work and the work of our employees, but because of John Kasich's ideas and hard work too. 
Thank you, Governor. As President Kasich says, his top priority would be putting the U.S. on a path of fiscal independence and strength. Well, the general manager of Kings Island may not be able to promise fiscal strength, but he knows a lot about what it takes to make people happy. Shad started working at Cedar Point Amusement Park in high school, and 35 years later, he's grown into an aficionado of fun. Kings Island is the 19th largest employer in the tri-state, according to Courier Research. It faces the unique challenge of bringing in about 4,000 seasonal employees each year. Locations such as Snag a Job, which is a newer internet-based uh, company where students can go apply, didn't exist a couple years ago, but now we're finding sites like this are actually driving uh, student applications to us. Shine says he's dedicated to teaching his employees to have fun. Well, Mercy Health Cincinnati has begun demolition of its closed hospital in Mount Airy. The process is expected to take until the end of the year. The facility closed in 2013 after the opening of Mercy Health's West Hospital in Green Township. Mercy Health is still seeking a buyer for the property. You may recall the health system offered to sell the nearly 70-acre site to Hamilton County for a dollar, but commissioners said it would cost too much to renovate the building. For photos of the demolition, you can visit the business Courier website. Well, here's an unusual pairing the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and Rheingeist Brewery. They are creating a beer called Glow Luminosity, Luminosity Pale Ale that goes on sale Monday. The beer is in honor of the sold out outdoor music and light show Luminosity that will run from August 5th through August 9th at Washington Park. The ale includes hints of summer melon and strawberry. Glow Luminosity Pale Ale is more evidence that Cincinnati's craft beer scene is exploding. In fact, the Midwest and Southeast are the fastest growing markets for craft brewing and beer. According to research by the Nielsen Company, Cincinnati saw the second highest growth in dollar volume of beer, as well as the second highest growth in craft brewers' dollar share of the beer market among U.S. cities. Cincinnati was surpassed only by Birmingham, Alabama. For some insight into Cincinnati's resurgence as a premier beer town, we are joined by Luis Gallardo, Director of Sales and Marketing for Rheingeist. He's with Business Watch producer Kelly Leon in the studio. Luis and Kelly. Thanks, Peg. Luis, thanks for being here. No, thanks for having me. So are you surprised by those stats? Um, surprised and not surprised. Of course, we didn't think that we'd come in the number two position in the whole country. Yeah. Um, but also not that surprised in the sense that We've never seen anything in other cities such as San Diego and Boston, the growth that we've experienced here. Our biggest problem so far, which from a business standpoint is not a bad problem to have, is not being able to keep up with demand. So ideally we'd be expanding faster, but without being able, able to fulfill the demand here in Cincinnati, it doesn't make sense to expand elsewhere. Yeah. So um, we've seen so many breweries come online. D how does it work in your community? Are you collaborators or are you competitors? Yeah, it's interesting because when Brian and Bob were building the, uh, the business plan, uh, they were, I think, five breweries here in Cincinnati. Then when we started, there were 12, now there's over 20. So to a lot of people, I think, I give a lot of the tours at Rheingeist. Some people are kind of hide the fact that they like Metro. Oh, I actually like this IP better. <laughs> right. And the reality is, is that while on paper we are competition, we're all really good friends and collaborators. Yeah. Um, Cincinnati hasn't reached anywhere near the level of saturation that it might in the future. So we're not really competing, more collaborating over different beer styles. And it's pretty exciting because, at least for the consumer, it's the most exciting part because not only do you have this great variety, but you have all these brewers who are pushing themselves and kind of propelling the diffusion of innovation. So. Madtree might be pushing a sour, and then we might come out with a barrel-aged beer, yeah. and someone might be not pressured, pressured, positive pressured yeah. into experimenting with ciders. Yeah. So for the consumer, it's just this overwhelming amount of beer that's heading their way, which I don't think is a bad thing. No, it's, it's funny. We do a lot of beer stories on this, this yeah. program. And so beer is good business here in Cincinnati. It is. <laughs> I mean, and we've had, I think, a unique opportunity. I think it's exploded here, especially because it has so many generations of yeah. brewing history. I think in the 1890s, their um, Cincinnati by population used to be the third largest producer of beer. Yeah. And then with prohibition, everything kind of just vanished. Yeah. Um, and in the city before a Mad Tree or Ryan Geist got started, you had places like Party Source in Kentucky or Neons. Mm -hmm. um, 
people or places that push craft beer but didn't really have the local craft to push. Yeah. And once we came on the map along with the other breweries, now over 20, they're able to push not only craft but also local craft. So That's great. they've really facilitated kind of this craft beer explosion here in Cincinnati. Well, quickly, we have to ask you while you're here, what's your favorite Rheingeist? So it always depends on the season. <laughs> right now, the one I'm most excited about is Streaker. Streaker. Streaker, we launched it for the All-Star Game. It was a crowdsourced IPA. Uh -huh. So an idea that I don't think too many people have done before. We basically had people vote on the different malts and hops. Um, I was kind of worried that giving the people all the control over what this beer would become yeah. would turn into something just way too complex or mushy. And it ended up tasting pretty good. And everyone, including our head brewer, Jim Matt, is very excited about the way it turned out. That's great. Well, we love having Ryan guys here in town. A lot of fun. Thanks so much for being here this morning. No, thanks again for having me. Peg, back to you. All right, thanks, Kelly and Luis, and I think they have fun at that company. Well, while we're talking about Cincinnati beer, we might as well touch on Cincinnati ice cream. The Food Network has named Grater's Black Raspberry Chip one of the top five ice creams in the country. The other four ice creams come from San Francisco, Philadelphia, Portland, and Brooklyn. Nice recognition, but we already knew Grater's was one of the best. Well, up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, Allegiant Air steps up at CVG. And a closing at the banks, apparently we don't love this bar and grill. news now that's getting a lot of attention on the business courier web and social media sites. Allegiant Airlines will establish a permanent base of operations at the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky International Airport in January of 2016. The airline will base up to three 156-seat aircraft at CVG and create 90 local jobs. It will also add five weekly flights to some of the most popular destinations, including Hilton Head, Las Vegas, Fort Lauderdale, and Tampa Bay. One of the original retail tenants at the banks is closed. Toby Keith's I Love This Bar and Grill defaulted under its lease, according to a statement from a spokeswoman for the banks. She said the bank's leasing team doesn't expect to have any problem filling the vacant space quickly. The University of Cincinnati unveiled designs for its potential renovation of Fifth Third Arena, a $70 million project to the 26-year-old arena in the heart of UC's campus. The arena serves as home for UC's men's and women's basketball teams and women's volleyball. The Courier is told there is no final decision on the renovation plan or timeline just yet. Well, everyone remembers the tech bubble, and we often look back with wonder at the obvious ex excesses, IPO mania, sky-high valuations, and companies with big promises but no profits. Could we be sitting in a similar position today? Well, in USA's, or today's U.S. Bank Economic 360, U.S. Bank Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager Mike Deniman joins Business Watch producer Kelly Leon to talk about the current tech environment. Thanks, Peg. Hi, Mike. Good morning. So first segment, I'm talking about beer. Now I get to talk about the tech bubble. <laughs> <laughs> so let's cut to the chase. Are we in another tech bubble? Well, you know, we're certainly starting to hear a lot more about that. And, you know, Peg really kind of hit the nail on the head, you know, when describing a lot of the hallmarks that we saw yeah. in, the, in the late 90s. And, uh, you know, when you look at the landscape today, we are starting to see some parallels. So, you know, it's, it's always difficult to see when you're in the middle of it. When you look back in 2020 hindsight, it's like, oh, that was obvious. How did, how did we miss that? But, you know, you want to make sure that you remember the lessons of that period and then see again if we're, we're seeing any similarities today. Uh, and then also, we all, always want to be careful when we start hearing four of the most dangerous words in investing, which are, it's different this time, <laughs> because usually it, it isn't. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are you seeing? What specifically are you seeing? Well, sure. So, uh, the, like I said, a lot of parallels out yeah. there. Uh, important to keep in mind that we're not talking about the Microsofts and the Intels of the world this time around. They're more like blue chips today, not like they were back in the go-go 90s. But the, the next generation of tech stocks, we're starting to see the same kind of sky-high valuations that we saw mm. back in the late 90s. It's yeah. not uncommon to find a, a price-to-earnings ratio of 100 or 200, which is off the, the charts. And that's if there are 
profits even to begin with. So, you know, those are similarities that we saw. And of course, as Peg mentioned, IPOs skyrocketing on the first day. That uh, that's kind of reminiscent of the late '90s. So. Those are some parallels, but what's getting a lot of media attention, what we're starting to hear more of are what are now called the, the, the unicorn companies and the problems that they might present. Unicorn companies, yeah. yeah. Right, it's not really a, an everyday word. No. It's a relatively new term within the tech industry, but it's describing startup companies that have raised a billion dollars or more in funding. And so think about that, a startup company mm -hmm. funding a billion or more. So. There's a lot of them out there now, estimated between 50 and 100. So we're not talking just a handful, but a lot. And many are well above a billion, sometimes mm -hmm. 25, 30 billion dollars. So wow. Yeah, and names that we're very familiar with, uh, Uber, Spotify, uh, Pinterest. Mm -hmm. But okay. important to remember that these are still private companies. They haven't had their IPO yet. Mm -hmm. They're backed by venture capitalists who eventually want to get their investment out of that, right. which means an IPO, and therein comes the worry. There's a lot of hype. But does the, the substance back up these very high dollar prices? So yeah. um, just to put that in quick context, you know, there are a lot of publicly traded non-tech companies been around for decades, highly profitable, and you know, names we, we're familiar with every day that aren't worth 25 or $30 billion. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have these startups just beginning their business, not profitable, might not ever be profitable and they've got these huge price tags. So mm -hmm. have, Interesting. have we heard that before? Yeah. yeah where, where, where did we see that? So, yeah. uh, you know, in the end, none of it means we're definitely in a tech bubble. It definitely doesn't mean that we're going to perhaps melt down the way we did in the 90s. But there are some things out there to be a little concerned about, to keep yeah. an eye on, and to just to be aware that, uh, you know, sometimes history repeats itself. Learn from the past, right. definitely. Right. Mike, thanks so much. Well, Peg, back to you. All right, thanks Kelly and Mike. And still to come on U.S. Bank Business Watch, it may sound odd, but Cincinnati is hot in Finland. We'll tell you why next. And congratulations to Sean Baker, a realtor with Comey and Shepard, another 40 under 40 honoree. In this morning's Business Insight, forget the British invasion. Cincinnati is experiencing a Finnish invasion. The region has lured three Finnish companies in the past six months, and more are on the way. It may sound like an unusual source to grow the local economy, but it's apparently working. On Capital, the executive director of the Greater Cincinnati European American Chamber of Commerce, is with business courier publisher Jamie Smith in the studio with more on why Finland. And thanks for coming in the studio today. My pleasure. Thank you, Jamie. All right, so the obvious question, why Finland? Well, let me answer with another question. Why not Finland? <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have discovered Finland in the last couple of years and have liked very much the connections that we've seen between the greater Cincinnati region and the country of Finland, the regions of Finland, the economy of Finland. And we put Finland on the ground as a small delegation from Cincinnati back in November. Uh, went back again in June, and we have found so much things in common that are driving this uh, opportunity for business opportunity and business development for our region. Okay. What kind of companies are we seeing? I know there's three that have already, have already come over. What kind of companies are they, and where are they locating here in the region? Uh, we're seeing very highly innovative family-owned companies uh, that have been very successful in Finland, uh, establishing their innovation, developing their technologies. Uh, growing to being um, 50, 100 million dollar companies, um, needing very much the export to be successful. Finland is a very small country, and so it is very essential for them to be able to sell outside of Finland. So they're already quite sophisticated in internationalizing, okay. uh, and but mostly have done so to Europe. As you know, uh, the Europe economy is slow to recover. And uh, Asia is getting a little bit more difficult. Um, and so the U.S. market is definitely uh, the next opportunity for them. But it's a lot further than what they've been used to. Okay. In Greater Cincinnati, the companies that have come so far 
Um, one of them has established itself in Blue Ash. Okay. Um, and they, that company will be the driver to bring additional companies. So perhaps that ah. initial footprint might favor uh, that part of the region, but we also have companies that have looked at Northern Kentucky. Um, other company right now that is hiring um, will decide exactly where they will start their office based on the location of the person they hire because okay. they want a proximity uh, to the, the, the person so that there's more efficiencies and it's more naturally linked together. But definitely the greater Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky region that's great. Is, a, is, a, is becoming the nest, if you yeah. will. Now when you go over with this delegation, what is it you guys are looking for? Is it a, something specific that you're looking for or you're just looking at what opportunities need a new home? We are very specific and we are very strategic and we're very targeted. So first of all, we work very closely with um, organizations, uh, with government agencies, um, with consultants in Finland who uh, are connected to the companies that we have identified as being yeah. the right industry, the right kind of companies, um, companies that are ready uh, to go to the U.S. so that when we go over there, the companies that are, we are meeting are meeting those, um, uh, this description. And so, for example, when we were there in June, we met with about uh, 80 business executives. Um, those were very specific business seminars with um, those targeted companies, and then we had specific meetings inside the companies okay. as well. Uh, so it's, it's really no fluff. It really is uh, okay. quite strategic, and as a result of it, that's why now since November, we've already seen three companies already yeah. established here. So what's n what, what is next? Is it retention of these companies, or is it, hey, let's go get more? Or is no. it both? For, bo both, <laughs> but first and foremost, the companies that are coming here are still a very, very early stage. Okay. And so this region has a very unique ecosystem to support them as they are trying to figure out what does it need to be successful establishing your operation here, what are the experts that can do that, what are the learning opportunities from other companies. Um, so consolidate the startup operations of those companies is first and foremost. But at the same time already thinking about if those companies are here and successful, what would be a perfect alignment with similar companies, similar regions of Finland so that we benefit from what we have already yeah. here so that it stimulates the growth but again for maximum success That's we're talking about we're, start, we're talking about startup operations of established yeah. companies but it's still a startup operation so that whole region ecosystem needs to come into play and that's what we do as a European American Chamber of Commerce so that all of those questions and needs and expertise comes together okay. at the right time to consolidate those startup operations. Right. Wayne, thank you so much for coming in today. I'd love to stay in touch with you. Maybe we can even get one of those companies to come on the show in a couple months and find out what their thoughts are. You let me know and it will be there. All thank right, you. great. Thanks. Back to you, Peg. All right, thanks. And thank you for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Peg Rosconi. Have a great Sunday.